This spring, the Centers for Disease Control released new data showing how the pandemic has worsened youth mental health. The CDC study found more than a third of high school students reporting they experienced poor mental health during the COVID-19 pandemic, and nearly half reporting they persistently felt sad or hopeless during the past year. Parents and families are one of the main sources of support when UW students navigate social anxieties, rigorous academic expectations, homesickness, and navigating friendships and relationships. In today's episode, Jana and I huddle up with Sasha Clark, who is a mental health therapist with the University of Washington Counseling Center. Sasha is part of a team that provides no-cost counseling services to UW students through in-person and online appointments. Sasha outlines the comprehensive mental health resources that exist on campus and some helpful strategies for parents and families to create a trusting, non-judgmental space to support your Husky as they navigate the complexities of college life. All right, we are here with Sasha Clark from the UW Counseling Center. Sasha, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. It's great to have you. Um, we would love to learn a little bit more about you. Uh, give us a little bit of your background, um, how you found yourself here at the University of Washington. Yeah, so I uh, have. I am a therapist at the University of Washington Counseling Center, and I've been in that role for about a year now. And I have been actually a UW employee for about 13 years. Prior to my role as therapist here at the Counseling Center, I, um, I was a contractor at King County Juvenile Detention providing mental health services to detained adolescents there, um, but was employed by the UW Department of Psychiatry. So when it was time for me to make a shift uh, career-wise, it made sense to try to stay within the UW family, and this opportunity opened up, and I was able to join the family here at the Counseling Center. That's awesome. Can you give us a little bit of an overview of the UW Counseling Center, the services that are offered? I know it's a wide variety of services, but um, you know, as, as, as you can, give us a, a brief overview of that. Yeah, so the UW Counseling Center um, is housed at Schmitz Hall, and we have been providing counseling services. I think the Counseling Center opened in the 1960s um, and has sort of evolved uh, over the decades. But currently, um, we provide no-cost counseling services to all enrolled UW students. Um, we provide uh, short-term counseling, and um, we also provide opportunities for workshops, for outreach, um, we do group counseling. Sometimes we are able to offer couples therapy. We have drop-in services for folks who want to kind of dip their toe into the counseling world and see what that's like. Um, and uh, we also do a lot of assistance with referring students to outside providers off campus if they're interested in engaging in longer-term services. Wow, so that feels very... Uh holistic and lots of short, uh, long-ish, and then referrals. Um, was there anything that has, it feels, I mean, I've had therapy before, so it feels very much something that is recognizable for folks that have sought out a mental health. Has the program evolved in the counseling center here at UW since, so uh, what is it, 1960s? <laughs> Yeah, yes, definitely. It's evolved. Um, there have been lots of different uh, evolutions of, of the kinds of services we provide. Um, and a lot, most notably in the last, you know, uh, 10 years or so. Um, so I think originally the counseling, like, you know, globally, I mean, not globally, but like in a larger sense, um, counseling centers were encouraged to be opened at universities post-World War II to provide services for veterans. Um, and I know, I, I was able to get a little information about this. I didn't know this until recently either, but, um, you know, in the 1980s here at the Counseling Center, we provided more long-term services, right? Like longer-term psychodynamic services and serve a smaller number of students, right? There was also, you know, in the 90s, there was, um, you know, fee-for-service stuff. So we were charging students to, to get services. 
Um, but in the early 2000s, they drop the fees and there's sort of more funding that started coming in from the student activities uh, fees, right? And so what's been changing a lot in the last decade or two, and especially, you know, most recently in the last several, in the last handful of years uh, due to the pandemic, is that there's been an increased destigmatization of mental health services, right? Which is wonderful, which, which is like, uh, you know, increasing access, increasing um, contact with more marginalized communities and folks that have had historical barriers to access services. Um, but what that also means is that our numbers have increased exponentially for people who are seeking services. And that's part of why we were sh we shifted to a, um, a short-term therapeutic model so that we would be able to serve all of the students that were seeking support um, in the way that we were able and the cap capacity that we we're able. I, another thing I want to say about um, how we're able to serve more students is that we um, is that there is such a robust body of support services on campus. So another thing that we try to do at the Counseling Center is help refer students to appropriate services based on the things that they're coming into our offices, um, asking questions about or experiencing struggles around. Can you give us an idea of kind of what does the what what does that student experience if they're seeking um, services on campus? What what does that look like from the point of like okay maybe I need to to you know schedule an appointment um, right through what that appointment might look like? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there are uh, you know multiple appointment types, right? So if someone is seeking group therapy, they can get on our website and take a look at the different groups that we're offering contact the front desk and get connected in that way, you know, drop-ins and things like that, you know, you can either contact the front desk or schedule online. But um, often the, the most common first point of contact is for individual therapy. And what a student would do is just either call our front desk or get onto our online scheduling system and everyone will have a client portal through our um, online system that they just log into with their student login. Um, and they can select their appointment and just um, do that online. And so at that point, they will get, you know, a little information um, via email saying, you know, this is the instructions for logging in. A big change that has happened in the last few years, of course, due to the pandemic, is that a lot of our services are offered virtually now. We do have um, in-person services offered, but many of our clients and uh, students who are, you know, accessing our services continue to want to access them virtually. So um, that's definitely available. So you'll get instructions for how to access the Zoom link and things like that. And then you will be connected with one of the therapists at the center here um, for an initial consultation appointment. And then in that initial consultation, you get kind of lots of information about the, the sort of different services that are available. Um, your therapist will work with you to, to make a plan for how to best move forward and get your needs met. How does that... Um manifests itself when you're now accepting virtual, do you feel like there's a different number of uh, students that you are reaching? Is there a bit of a jump now because it's so accessible for them to come and meet you, you know, at, at different times of the day? Um, has that uh, increased the, the amount of students seeking counseling centers help? You know, that's a really good question, and I don't know the answer to that if our numbers have actually increased. Um, I will say the one, like, data point that I do have about that is that um, the, the distribution of graduate students and undergrads has changed since we've been virtual and that we have more graduate students accessing uh, our services and fewer undergrads. And so I think what that tells us is that like the grad student level um, folks who are coming to us find it easier to access our services virtually. Um, and, and I think, you know, undergrads tend to prefer in person over the over the um, the virtual. So we're working to try to kind of even that out. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense in terms of, you know, the availability of, of a new way to access the service would, would open the door to, to new populations. I'm, I'm wondering what, what sort of topics are, are, you, are, you, are you seeing, right? And, and so maybe I don't, and I, and I assume that the topics change and evolve over the course of the academic year. 
Um, but you know, when you're looking at that first quarter, when you're looking at maybe even first year students who might be uh, seeking uh, the counseling center, what sort of things are they are they hoping to talk about? That is a great question. Um, and you know, as I'm sure you you know have probably guessed that we have just such diverse conversations. There's such a variety of um, of stories that people are coming in the door wanting to tell. Um, but I will, you know, I like your I like your comment about things being different through the course of the year because that's definitely true. Um, you know, a lot of the time I'll talk with students who are here, they're first year students, or they're just kind of transitioning into something new, and it's that transition point that's causing stress, that's causing anxiety. There's homesickness, or there's kind of um, uh, some fears around navigating new social situations. Social anxiety comes up. Um, you know, figuring out how to build new routines, how to um, uh, work on, you know, building new relationships. So that's those are a lot of the sort of themes that come up in the fall. Um, and then, you know, as we get more towards winter, I think we see, you know, um, the onset of some more um, kind of doldrums, some seasonal depression that can come with the darkness and, you know, people who have kind of slogged through the first part of the year. They've set, maybe settled into routine and their anxiety around some of that stuff is diminished, but now they're sort of making their way through. Um, I mean, I think probably we can all sort of relate, right, just to that seasonal arc. So we'll see the same stuff with our students. Um, and, you know, as you would expect throughout the year, we've got students struggling with the pressures of rigorous academic expectations, um, separation from family, just regular life stuff that we all go through, relationship um, challenges. Um, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. How does this, um, I'm, I'm sure the families uh, perked up in hearing the words homesickness and missing folks and missing their family and friends and um, that, that that tends to kind of fluctuate during, throughout the year and wanting to see how families can be helpful during that times of calm or my favorite, they didn't say anything to me that there's an issue or there's some homesickness, but kind of helping kind of encourage that conversation with their students prior to the panic or the <laughs> or any an anxious moments. Um, you know, we're happy to help our families kind of navigate it. It's going to, you know, I, I'd love to say that it might, that it will not happen to your student, but there will be a time when they're, they're here to be challenged. And that also comes with a lot of challenges towards their mental health and wanting to give them some really great tools to get that conversation started, hopefully before coming to campus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I think you're really touching on a really important, um, you know, challenge that families encounter, right? We have these students, they're in this sort of stage of emerging adulthood, right, where they're, um, they're launching kind of for the first time. And I think, you know, it's a tough time for both the student and the caregivers um, to to navigate that transition. Um, I think that some parents and families may be surprised to know that students cite, this, we talk about this in our parent orientation, that students cite um, parents as you know, one of their top sources of information and then one of their top sources of like who they go to um, in, when they're in need of support. And something that I think parents probably have concern about or worry about is, oh, I don't want my, you know, my kid to feel judged by me, you know, if they come to me and they're talking about something that, like, they're worried I'm going to judge them about. Um, I think that that is a concern that students have. So how do we kind of um, adopt, like, preemptively a non-judgmental stance, giving permission for feelings to happen, right? Um, and a lot of the time we can do this by modeling that behavior, right? Learning how to name our, like how to name our emotions, how to feel them, and then how to sort of um, not, 
necessarily act out all of our emotions at, even as we feel them, right? That that's a good uh, modeling that we can do for our students. And, you know, I think also um, something I actually hear quite frequently from students that may, may come as more of a surprise to caregivers is that I have students coming in here talking about what's going on for them and saying that they don't want to talk to their families about them, their, their problems or their challenges because they don't want their parents or families to feel burdened, right? Which, um, as a parent myself, I, you know, my, I fervently hope that I can figure out how to help my kids not feel, feel that way, right? That there is openness and that there's a non-judgmental space that they can come to. Um, to work out some of these really new challenges that they may be facing and maybe feel like they have to face alone just to let them know that you're there and you know you're in their corner you're cheerleading them you want to partner with them you have information for them um, and you can hold that space non-judgmentally for them mm -hmm. I know that there are several federal laws that you know prevent um, you from sharing information with parents if they were to call or to express concern or anything like that. What sort of advice do you have for parents and families as as they're trying to support their student who might be utilizing mental health services, um, but maybe they're in that situation where their student is, you know, is not at a place where they're comfortable sharing that information with them. How, how do they navigate that type of situation? That is a tricky one. I mean, my, I think first, you know, line of action there is always to go to the source to try to you know and you know even if you're encountering resistance or not really wanting you know your student not really wanting to open up to you to remain um open to providing that space right so whenever they do feel ready that they know that you're there um and you know, I we I do have conversations with parents sometimes who are just trying to figure out what the services are that are available and how to help you know connect their students with that. Um, but you're right, HIPAA does prevent uh, the therapists here from having any kind of conversation that, that about any sort of personal. I like I couldn't if you called and asked if your student was seeing a counselor here, I couldn't tell you that. Right, we can't disclose that information. So it you know you do have to um, you know have the explicit permission of your student to have any information about that. So just sort of remaining open um, and then, you know, knowing how, you know, how to hook your student up with the kind of possible support services they might need. I think that that's very helpful because I, I would say we, not only does uh, <laughs> Sasha get these phone calls, um, Carlos has, I have, and um, I really wanted to, uh, if I could allay some concerns, our staff members are very good at being able to share resources, and but not necessarily be able to talk about what's going on or even confirm for students. But what I do appreciate is that the Counseling Center has really been very um, helpful in providing talking points when fa when families are concerned. And I was wondering if you could tell, talk a little bit about how that, um, that resource was developed, because I, I share that with our families throughout the year um, in moments of calm, <laughs> in moments of crisis. It's a really great way for framing that conversation and talking to their Huskies about maybe it's time to go see someone, maybe it's time to seek help, how can I help? It, I, it just does a really great job of of giving you kind of the right language to encourage that conversation. Yeah, I, you know, I honestly don't know the answer to your question about how it was developed. My assumption is that either a therapist or a group of therapists here put it together at some point um, to have as a resource for families to access. Well, I'm grateful for it, so thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Are there other ways, um, I know that the Counseling Center, you've mentioned earlier that, you know, there's kind of a matrix approach on how we provide care and wellness throughout UW. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, what else and who else <laughs> uh, besides the UW Counseling Center um, students can seek out for, for support. 
Yeah, I think, um, you know, a great starting point if you're a parent or family member seeking information about this is to check out the well-being website um, because we've tried to make it a sort of clearinghouse um, website starting point for all things wellness related at the U. So it's wellbeing.uw.edu. And if you check that, um, when you check that site out, you'll see a bunch of tabs there that um, are, you know, that'll take you to um, the counseling center, that will take you to Live Well. Um, so Live Well provides a lot of services um, for students who are maybe struggling with um, substance use challenges or students who have experienced sexual abuse or assault um, and have uh, professionals who um, have specific skill sets around helping students navigate through those challenges. So often we will maybe in tandem with therapy or as an alternative, we'll refer students there if that's their particular um, challenge. We've got great academic support programs and academic support coaches. So if a student comes in here and says, I'm really struggling to keep up with academics in particular, we can refer them to work with an academic support coach. Um, we have amazing wellness and recreation um, resources. So, um, you know, one of the things that's really close to my heart is the outdoors and trying to help students learn how to get outside and enjoy the um, benefits of being in nature and just, you know, getting fresh air. So we have like amazing rec opportunities. There's ways to go and get, you know, learn how to do rock climbing or kayaking and get all of the um, equipment to do that. There's also a, a great resource around like mindfulness work. There's all kinds of, um, of workshops and um courses that you can take around mindfulness meditation or around doing yoga um, or other kinds of ways of moving your body um, in order to kind of increase your overall felt sense of well-being. Um, one of the workshop series that myself and one of the other clinicians here, John Weber, um, developed last quarter was um, called connecting mindfully with nature. So we are kind of taking both of that, nat that natural world and that mindfulness piece and kind of putting them together and inviting students to get outside with us and do some sort of mindfulness activities and meditations together. So we'll be offering some of those again in the fall. Um, I'm actually leading one for a class this afternoon. Um, so we're trying to, and, and also, so it's good to know about UW Sustainability. They're um, an organization, or a part of the campus organization that is doing a ton of work on, um, on their, they do research and then they also have um, workshop offerings around um, sustainable living on campus and around campus. So those are just a couple of the really awesome resources that we try to help students feel connected to because they all are connected to how we um, can increase our, our well-being and our balance because it's pretty easy to get off kilter when you're laser focused on academic achievement um, and in, in a pretty rigorous environment. And so how do we kind of remain attuned to the variety of needs that we have? And I think that's definitely something that families and uh, parents can help encourage their student to remember about and check in on. How are you tending to yourself? How are you tending to all of your needs? It sounds like those are also good reminders for parents and families themselves as they are managing this transition as well. Yes, I, I will. Here's my little pr plug for sometimes it's okay not to check the Facebook group. Thank you for joining. <laughs> it's, it's also nice. To all, commuting with nature here at UW Seattle campus is a blessing and it's a wonderful place to be throughout the season. And I'm so grateful that you are all creating this type of work. Um, you know, it's not, it's not like we're going to go inside a clinic or we're going to go into an office. Our office is nature. <laughs> and and uh, it's really great. I think I forgot to ask, like, how many folks work at the counseling center? 
Um, it sounds like it's a lot of it's a great team and very thoughtful about their approaches and utilizing space <laughs> here on campus. Yeah. Yeah, I should know the answer to that. I think if we have like 20 something, maybe 26 clinicians, not all of the clinicians here are providing 100% full time clinical direct service. So that's why I'm a little bit hazy on the exact number. But it's it's a it's it sounds like a lot, but it's not that many folks. If you think about the our potential yes. client base of whatever we're, we're at 50,000, 50, <laughs> 50, 50,000 students. Um, but we, we do our best and we try to serve all the needs of the students that come through our doors. And we really do want everyone to know about the services that we provide so that they can feel this sort of web of support around them. Because we know that this is a trying time. It's, you know, it's an exciting time and it's a time of transition. It's a time of tremendous growth, but it can be, it can be a lot. So we want to be there and kind of help walk with you through it. And the fact that, you know, the services are pretty comprehensive, right, in terms of, um, you know, and you said it before of just like the different types of, of services, you know, not everyone might, you know, need a, a full on, you know, therapy appointment, but, you know, being able to drop into the, the Let's Talk, the virtual Let's, let's Talk or um, any of the workshops that are provided, I feel like are are just things that, you know, every every conversation I feel like we have on this podcast really identifies just the sheer number of opportunities on this campus. And that is definitely true for, for mental health resources as well. Yeah, and actually I'm glad that you're, um, when I was listening to you talk, it reminded me to say something about um, my SSP as well. Because one, uh, we, we, the Counseling Center does not offer 24-7 crisis service, but we do contract with an organization called MySSP that does provide that. So we are sure to sort of advertise widely that the service is available. There's a phone number that you can call. It's on our website. It's kind of all over everywhere um, that you can access 24-7 um, if experiencing a crisis, right? So it's sort of um, a crisis line that's particular. Uh, specifically tailored towards uh, students on our campus. Um, and it's there's an app that you can just put on your phone. I tell all my students that I meet with, just put the app on your phone. You might need it at some point. Someone you know might need it at some point. It's just great to have to have access to it if you're experiencing, um, you know, any kind of acute mental health symptoms from like having a panic attack or uh, a kind of suicidal ideation. If there's anything that's that feels like I need to talk to someone immediately that you can have access to that. And I would imagine is that is that resource available? Like if a family member is concerned, would a, would that resource be available to to a family member or a parent? Um, I'm pretty sure it's for enrolled students. Oh, okay, so yeah, it's it's specifically for students. Yeah, yeah, similar to our services. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, definitely. And my SSP came about in the pandemic, isn't that correct? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we've just um, renewed our contract with them, so they'll, they'll be around for the school year. I'm also um, grateful for the the access to various different providers that can speak various different languages as well. Uh, you know, we have a very strong international student uh, population, so talking to somebody in your native <laughs> language and your um, would help kind of create that more trusting and welcoming space. I, I often like to remind families that as well, and it, it makes folks very calm <laughs> to hear that, that not only is it 24-7, there's also someone that can speak your language um, and be really helpful. Um, I'm, I, I'm sure I'm not the only one. Most recently, we've just heard about the 988 uh, service as well, uh, just as an, an, an additional aspect for, I think, not just for students, but for families within the United States to be able to use. I, talking about destigmatizing, seeking out help, I'm really grateful that we're <laughs> at this time, uh, we have access to all of those things, which is really great. Um, I did want to talk about the thing that um, we all work through within student life about um, talking to and reaching out to to students. Um, there's advisors there, there's uh, student health wellness folks, the live well folks are there. Um, Safe Campus and UWPD are, are also there to kind of 
um, help talk about uh, students that we may need to be reaching out to and helping. Um, so um, that we do have a collaboration between ourselves and um, residential life where there are some liaisons uh, between the center and residential uh, life staff who are able to communicate. Uh, one of our therapists is a dedicated res life liaison. So whenever the folks who are working with students in the residential capacity have a concern or have um, uh, something that they feel like they, they need to consult on, they know where to go to for that and how to, how to connect with us. Um, does that include um, roommate kind of uh, mediation or talking to each other about talking about sharing new space, new home, new rooms. Some of our students, this might be their first time actually sharing space with somebody completely different from their families. So this is this is uh, another thing that's really a great resource on campus is that that's all handled through residential life and they've got you know they've got some folks who are trained to do that and they also have peer support folks that are trained to to mediate and to help folks through some of that stuff. So we are sort of a little bit of a detached con consult arm for when things feel a little bit more um, tricky or tangled or um, maybe that there's some mental health related component um, that we're available for consult, but we don't personally go in and do that work. We, we um, support that. Yeah, I think, I mean, the one thing that that illustrates, right, is that we're pretty well connected as an institution through that student care team, through the different referrals and just the connections that we have on campus. I feel really fortunate that, you know, those connections do exist so that if something is identified in a classroom or if something is identified in a residence hall, that then those communication avenues are open for, for us to find support for that student or, you know, to share information because there's so many, you know, probably individual events that happen. Um, and so in order for us to be able to kind of triangulate all of that, all of that information and, and to be able to provide good support to students, I feel like, you know, the counseling center is, is very well connected on campus for that to happen. Right, right. And just to be clear also um, in terms of confidentiality, um, we, we have, uh, when we have communication around a particular student, we always uh, make sure to have a student aware of that and sign releases in order for us to communicate with each other so that there's nothing that's happening without, you know, that sort of knowledge and um, trust sort of remaining intact. With the student, for sure. Awesome. Well, we're getting toward the end of our, our time. Sasha, any like advice, any last minute kind of pieces of information that you'd like to share with uh, parents and families listening? I'm, I'm sure that the parents and families listening to this podcast have like an amazing skill set in place already. You got your student this far. They're thriving. They're, you know, in this really energizing, exciting new environment. Um, so I don't purport to, to know any more than you do, but I will say that um, offering your student sort of that non non-judgmental kind of positive regard, that unconditional love and acceptance just can go a real long way when they're struggling and they're not sure if they should be doing things on their own or if it's, okay, it's still okay to come to you. Um, and just sort of being that home base energetically for them um, so that when they're ready or when they are in need, they feel, they feel welcome, that that's, you know, a great gift that you can give to your student. Yeah. Very well said. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us today. This has been awesome. My pleasure. Thanks. We'll see you on those mindful meditation walks on campus. <laughs> yeah. We're thinking about trying to offer some for, for staff. Uh, at some Carlos and well, I will so. be the first two people there. <laughs> Thank you so much. The Husky Huddle Up podcast is a collaboration between the University of Washington first year programs and parent and family programs to provide parents and families equitable access to information in support of their student success. The Husky Huddle Up is produced by me, Chloe Giselle, a senior in the UW Cinema and Media Studies program.